Hi, how is everyone doing? I hope all of you are having an engineering and this learning experience at XT Summit 2022. I am Manish Shekhawat, working as Director of Experience Technology at Publicis Sapient, currently involved in the digital transformation journey of a North American client and retail industry. So the topic of my talk today is evolution in your application architecture, primarily focusing on scale, resilience, and performance. And when I say this, I want to be very precise that I'm not going to talk about the historical evolution of architecture from monolith to client server to service oriented to cloud. I'm primarily focusing on the how your application architecture evolves during the requirement, design, and development phase. But before I deep dive into the technical aspects of it, let me narrate you an incident that happened a few years back with me and that made me choose this particular topic. So the year was 2012. I was working as a senior product developer, building a multimedia rich content heavy application for a talent hunt organization catering to North American and Indian clients. We had built the best of the functional requirement. We had built the best of the user experience and we were thriving on it. But one fine day, this happened. Remember this guy, Sai, he released a Gangnam style video and the internet went crazy. People were making cover videos, dance videos, and the total number of views that you see on YouTube right now is 4.3 billion for this song. So our marketing team decided to harness this trend and launch a campaign which caters to it. So finally, on day zero of the campaign launch, Within few hours of life, our application went slow. People start complaining about the slowness of the application. And in next few hours, the application went into the mode of traffic cho choking. And, in the, and eventually it, it crashed. So it took us around eight hours to bring the application back live after a lot of brainstorming to cater the situation. This was the date when it happened. Now, from, from this particular disaster that happened, we not only lost the time, but actually the credibility. And the lessons learned during that time, I'm trying to share with you here. So what we did wrong was that we never considered the disaster recovery and availability aspect of design of an application. We never thought of the point of failures, be it single point of failures or multiple point of failures across the multiple layers of architecture. We never considered the load model to cater peak and spike loads in, in scenarios like the campaign launch. We had load balancing, but those were not configured correctly. Our APIs were not having rate limit and we also suffered the DDoS. And all of our requests were being served from origin and we never had a caching strategy. So before I proceed to solve this problem, let me give you a disclaimer. Architectural investments are subject to multiple risk. Read all requirement related documents carefully before implementing. And when I say so, and because I'm going to use a sample reference architecture, it may or may not be applicable to all the scenarios and use cases. Please read about the requirements and the non-functional requirements based on your client and use case. Now, what are these requirements that I'm talking about? Can we categorize these requirements into certain themes? which clients are looking for in your application. So they could be asking for a global and multilingual application. They want to have millions of users catering to the broad range of content on the application. And the application should be responsive and multi-device supported. And no, who doesn't look for awesome user experience? Clients are always looking for a user retention and new user acquisition. The application should support the features to be shipped as soon as possible to the market. And certain features we are, which are very specific to the application like personalization and localization. And it, of course, it should be able to handle the inconsistent and high loads. And nobody likes to have bugs in the system or at least if there are bugs, it is easy to be find them. And the application should have a continuous new development supported by an automation of CI, CD, and quality control. And application should be always up and running. Eventually, the clients are looking for value of money, right? They want to make the application build quickly, have the change as fast as possible, and affordable to manage. Now, as an architect or a senior developer, we would always want to 
align to certain architectural principle and these requirements should map to them. So what are those, those architectural principle I'm talking about? It should be scalable, it should be stable, it should be reactive, it should have an efficient, it should be measurable, it should be performant, resilient, and secure. Now, when we talk about these principles, we should always look at what is the actual ask the client is coming up, up with. What uh, if the requirements are clear or not clear? What are some of the assumptions that we are taking and are we getting those validated? What are some of the dependencies that we have on the internal or the third parties? Do we have the concurrent load model? Are we providing any certain value added services? So when we, we talk about three primary key aspects of scale, resilience, and performance, let us define them. Scale is the adaptive compute and request handling without ad giving additional instruction to manage the load. And then we talk about resilience. Resilience is primarily the aim is to bring the application up and running at least three digit nine percentage and so that we do not lose the, uh, the users. And performance, serving the best user experience at the right speed is the primary principle of performance. And we all know that these features that we are talking about are measurable, but the parameter of measurement could be different depending upon which layer we are talking about. All right, does this picture of architecture look blurry to you? Don't worry, it is actually blurry, not just in view, but also to understand it, given the complexity of the solution and the multiple layers involved, wouldn't it be awesome if we could have a step-by-step -step guide how the application architecture is evolved? Because understanding it in one go is difficult, which is communicating with which layer and how have we introduced new layers or eliminated certain layers? Wouldn't it be good if it is not just easy to understand, but also reduce the complexity of the solution and is easy on the eye? How does this one look like? I know it is about Pictionary, right? So let, let's maybe it is still complex and abstract, but it is at least easy to look at, at, not scary. So let's evolve this architecture diagram. Let's take a base use case of an e-commerce application, which is being migrated from an old tech stack to a new tech stack. So primary are actors, right? Users are the king and queen. And we have a legacy application, warehouse application, order management application already running. We have a monolithic front end already running. We have data store, right? Database where all the data is being stored. And there's a business engine running in the background to manage the processing of the, that data. Most of the e-commerce application have product and pricing catalogs to manage the information of the product detail and pricing of the, of the products. Now, to safeguard against any sort of DDoS attack, usually there is a firewall which is in front of the application. And in most of the legacy application communicating with the, with the different third-party systems, there, there are feeds that are generated. And these feeds are being communicated between your, between your third party and the, and the legacy systems. And because usually the e-commerce applications are content rich, and manage content rich, the content authors play a very important role in that. All right, so most of the content that you see is in multimedia content, right? For example, audio, video, text, or images, and that requires a dedicated digital asset management system. And we cannot directly make a request to your backend system and, and jeopardize the security of the application. We need a gateway in, fr in front of that to cater that. API gateway sits in between the, the client and the multiple services that are running behind the scene. It also acts as a reverse proxy to take the multiple API request calls, uh, aggregate or orchestrate those services and return appropriate results. And that's how it solves the scale, resilience and performance issues. We also need a, a SSR engine. Now we are evolving this this monolithic old migrated old, old legacy application to a new application where we are thinking about building a, a, a assembly layer to create our pages using a server side rendering engine. And breaking our monolithic front end into micro front end for better management. 
most of the application has certain configuration in terms of your feature flags, in terms of your third party configuration and whatnot. It is always considered better to use a config server. And of course, we cannot rely on, on the files to store uh, the key sensitive information. And that's where key vaults come into picture. When I was talking about API Gateway, I mentioned about the reverse proxy, right? How API Gateway also acts as a reverse proxy. But we, we, are, we have also created a node layer, and that's where we also need a reverse proxy. Now, what is a reverse proxy? Reverse proxy is sits behind firewall in a private network, and it serves the traffic as well. When I was talking about the backend business engine, we, we were making a single call to business engine and getting all the information. Wouldn't it be better if we can distribute those into multiple services and they take care of the single responsibility principle are easy to deploy individually as well and scale as well. And that's where the resilience and scale factor is solved in the microservices layer. Now there could be scenarios where your REST-based REST gateway or REST-based APIs are not, not sufficient enough. And you want to go ahead with the scenario where you want to solve the problem of underfetch and overfetch of the, uh, the response as well as manage the payload. And that's where the GraphQL also comes into the picture. Now there are certain features which third, there are certain features which are always needed in most of the application like a payment gateway in e-commerce or analytics for that matter. An authentication authorization of your user for guest and recognized or the logged in users. Then third parties, most of the times that range between 50 to 100 as well. And of course, you want to have multi personalized multi-brand application support. Now that we have built such a huge application, we should be having, we should be having a logging and monitoring tool to manage that and maintain that application in case of any issues. We have put in the CDN layer and CDN layer provided the performance aspect of the application because it serves the multimedia artifacts as well as the application artifacts along with the pre-generated pages for use in case of, in case of uh, application unavailability and the origin unavailability that could be served from the cache itself. Now caching could be done at the CDN level. You can uh, cache your HTML or asset caches. At the same time, we want to introduce the caching strategies across multiple layers of the architecture. So it could be at the SSR engine where we could have an in-memory cache to store maybe the pre-generate page or the API responses, like for example, something which does not change often in case of your page layout service, maybe your labels, maybe certain config keys. You can have front-end cache as well in your system. It could be local storage, it could be session storage, it could be cookies, depending upon what and how you are using that. Now we are talking about the front-end caching, but the caching is applicable to the CMS, databases, as well as the business engines as well. And we can create caching for your key vault and config servers. Now, when we talk about caching, doing the cache in integration is easy, but what happens in case of the distributed cache? Right? Distributed cache solves the purpose that we do not have to only rely on a single node or single pod or a single server to manage the cache. Whereas you can utilize features of like, for example, Microsoft Azure cache to manage that distributed cache and all the systems are connected to an event driven architecture for that. But this needs to be invalidated in case of stale data. We can come up with certain strategies. One of them is the time to live based one, TTL based. The other one could be reactive or the third one could be based on the event driven as I mentioned. Now, all of these caching strategies are primarily solving the, the, the problem of performance as well as scalability, because it is not going in depth into the layers of the origin, but only focusing on the, on the caching layer and saves your origin from multiple redundant calls. Now, when we're talking about the reverse proxy, we came up with the traffic management or a smooth traffic management between the client and the server machines. And that's where traffic manager helps you to divert traffic according to the need and request being made. One interesting bit that has come recently that I have noticed is using the edge workers. Now, why do we need edge workers? Wouldn't it be better something like CDN, which could solve the problem of creating features, like for example, geolocation based store locator, or maybe autocomplete based search, 
or maybe personalized content for some users. And that's where edge worker comes into the picture. And it is very close to the user and execute these kind of execution. The other execution part could be URL decoding or HTTP compression and whatnot. Most of such applications rely on notification services of two types. One to handle the monitoring bits and the second one is related to the, to the notification being sent to the users and they also choke these, the servers and the traffic in many scenarios. Now, these could also be managed through a different perspective called serverless. And serverless could be executed in multiple layers, not just at one layer, right? For example, it could be at the business engine layer, it could be at the CMS layer, it could be at the config server layer, it could be at the, at the key vault layer. Now, what is serverless? Serverless is a cloud native development model that allows us to run certain application without managing these servers. Now, what could be the scenario for that? Do these? Any job that requires you to run intensive parallel transformation processing could be executed into the serverless and getting results as early as possible. And these scenarios could be very infrequent or, or sporadic in demand as well. And these solves the problem of resilience in that case. And let's connect the dots now. Each layer is communicating and, and con connecting with which layer, right? Now, what are some of the takeaways that I would want you to take from this particular talk? Of course, the first three definitions that we talked about, scale, resilience, and performance. Application should be auto-intelligent to scale up and down depending upon the need without additional instructions given to that. Similarly, for resilience, one of the primary aim of, of resilience is to keep the application up and running to three digit per time percentage and given the losses that could happen because of this uh, resilience not maintained. And third one is serving the best user experience at right speed as the primary principle of performance. And how do you achieve those things? Design scalable solutions to handle both peak and spike load using load models. Resilience could be avoided through single point of failures and utilize availability zones and disaster recovery servers as well. And look beyond the given design to serve the performance. Thank you.